Let us read together the sacred scriptures in the seventh chapter of the Epistle to the Romans. Romans chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. When the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Read Holy Scripture this far. With this topic, the role of the law in sanctification, we are plunged into doctrinal controversy. 
exposed to one of the main issues concerning the gospel of grace throughout the entire New Testament and confronted by a truth that is fundamental to the Christian life and the Christian experience. The role of the law in the sanctification of the child of God is controversial. Some churches, notably the Roman Catholic Church, teach that the law's role is to justify, sanctify, and thus save the law keeper. There are other churches and theologians who deny that the law has any role at all in the Christian holy life, whatever. These are the antinomians to which error I devote my last speech at this conference. The Reformed faith, and when I speak of the Reformed faith, I am including Presbyterianism. The Reformed faith has its own distinctive, unique doctrine of the role of the law in sanctification. This is of the greatest importance to maintain among ourselves and to witness to others. This unique view of the Reformed faith concerning the role of the law I will propose in this speech. I note here that the truth of the role of the law was controversial in the church already in apostolic times and on the pages of the New Testament as we read in Romans 7. The role of the law is no minor matter but a main aspect of the gospel of grace. This is evident in Romans 7. It is indicated also in the fifth chapter of the epistle to the Galatians. There we learn that those who assign an erroneous role to the law, namely that of justifying the sinner, are in fact denying Jesus Christ and have themselves fallen from grace. Galatians 5 verse 4. On the other hand, as Galatians 5 teaches, those who deny the law any role in salvation, particularly regarding a holy life, are guilty of an error that results in fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and of not walking in the spirit. That's Galatians 5 verses 13 through 26. The Reformed faith does justice to the role of the law in sanctification and in the Christian life. This truth of the role of the law is immensely practical. It is fundamental to the Christian life and experience. To be taught that the law itself will make you holy so that the Christian life consists of striving to obey the commandments is to set the Christian an impossible task. On the other hand, to exclude the law altogether is to expose the church and the member of the church to the deadly error of lawlessness and of supposing that what in fact is rebellion against the will of God is godly and accepted behavior. The Reformed doctrine concerning the role of the law avoids both these fatal errors and guides the believer on the narrow way that has God's approval and leads to eternal life and glory. Romans 7 plainly addresses our topic of the role of the law in sanctification. The subject in Romans 7 is the Christian holy life and the Christian experience of God's favor upon him or her as he leads this Christian life. The question of Romans 7 is, how shall we bring forth fruit unto God? Verse 4, and thus not bring forth fruit unto death. 
verse 5. The great theme of the chapter, Romans 7, is that we, quote, serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter, end quote, verse 6. The outstanding determination of the apostle in this chapter is that, like him, quote, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, end of quote, verse 25. In the preceding chapters, the apostle has condemned the teaching and practice of seeking justification by the law. In Romans 7, the apostle condemns the mistaken teaching and practice of seeking sanctification by the law. He exposes that as erroneous without denying that the law has an important role to play in the holy life of the Christian. I want to point out, first of all tonight, what the role of the law in your sanctification and mine is not. The law, and I mean by the law, the law of God, the law that Romans 7 describes as good, holy, and just, the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, the law of God does not sanctify us. That is, the law does not make us holy so that we devote ourselves to God and live in separation from the world. It is a mistake, a common but serious mistake to suppose and even to teach that the law's role in our salvation is that it sanctifies us. Reformed and even some Protestant people recognize that the law does not and cannot justify the sinner, that is, constitute him righteous before God the judge. The book of Romans is clear. For example, in chapter 3, verse 28, that a man is justified by faith altogether apart from the deeds of the law. Galatians 3, verse 11 denies explicitly that any man, quote, is justified by the law in the sight of God, end quote. The reason for this denial is then stated in Galatians 3, quote, for the just shall live by faith, end quote. Protestant people recognize, if they have any knowledge of the Bible at all, that justification is not obtained from the law. But it is sometimes supposed, in the matter of our sanctification, our living holy, obedient lives, the means and power to accomplish this sanctification is the law. In this aspect of our salvation, the law that has been banished with regard to justification comes back, comes into its own, and plays the decisive role. The gospel justifies by faith, it is thought. The law sanctifies by our working. There are reasons for this error. There are no biblical or creedal grounds for this error, but there are reasons for this mistake, namely to suppose that the law sanctifies us. First, the law is the good and holy word of God, as the apostle recognizes in Romans 7, verse 12, quote, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good, end quote. Second, obviously, the law is concerned, deeply concerned, with the holy life of the chosen and redeemed children of God. What is more natural then, what is more fitting than that for sanctification, we look to the law. And a third reason for supposing that the law sanctifies us is that every Reformed 
or Presbyterian or Calvinistic Christian is and ought to be on his or her guard against the gross heresy and wicked practice of antinomism. That's the denial that the law has any role whatsoever in the Christian life, other perhaps than to show us our sinfulness. And that's the proposal, is antinomism, that the believer may freely transgress the commandments of God. If we deny that the law sanctifies, are we not making ourselves guilty of that dread error of antinomism, or at least guilty of opening ourselves up to that false doctrine and its subsequent lawlessness of life? Nevertheless, the truth, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as confessed by the Reformed faith, is that as little as the law justifies us, so little does the law sanctify us. That the law does not and cannot sanctify us is the burden of the message of Romans 7. The message of Romans 7 is not only that our sanctification in this life is always imperfect, and that is part of the message of Romans 7, as you yourself discerned when we read the chapter. But the burden of Romans 7 is also that the law does not sanctify, so that for this aspect of his or her salvation, one looks to the law in vain. The great theme or subject of the chapter, Romans 7, Continuing the subject of the preceding chapter, chapter 6, and concluded in chapter 8, is that aspect of salvation that we call sanctification. That's deliverance from the power of sin, cleansing from the pollution of sin, so that we yield our life to God in holiness. That holiness is the theme of chapter 6 through 8 in the epistle to the Romans is stated in Romans 6 verse 1, quote, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, end quote. That the truth of holiness is continued and completed in Romans 8 is apparent in Romans 8 verse 1, which speaks of walking not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Walking after the Spirit is the Christian life of holiness by virtue of the divine saving work of sanctification. And nowhere in this outstanding section of Holy Scripture concerning the subject or truth of sanctification do we read that our sanctification is by the law. Nowhere are we taught that the law sanctifies us so that we are to look to the law for this aspect of our salvation. On the contrary, Romans 7 is at pains to deny that the law sanctifies and to warn us not to look to the law or to depend upon the law for holiness of life. For holiness... Verse 4 teaches, we had to become dead to the law. Only in this way of becoming dead to the law could we bring forth fruit unto God. According to verse 6, to serve God in, quote, newness of spirit, end quote, we must be delivered from the law. So far is it from being true that the law sanctifies, that is, that the law is the power of making God's people holy, that on the contrary, it is exactly the law that is the occasion of sin, and especially of the abounding of sin, and the means by which sin in us, quote, 
becomes exceeding sinful. End of quote, verse 13. I quote verse 8 of the chapter. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. End of quote. Then again, verse 9, quote, When the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. End of quote. Then also verse 11, quote, Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, that is, by the law of the Ten Commandments, deceive me, and by it, the law, the good law of God, slew me, end of quote. Quote again, sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That which is good is the law of God, the Ten Commandments. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. End of quote, verse 13. However, this is to be explained. The Apostle repeatedly emphasizes that the explanation is not that the law is sinful, is not that there is something wrong with the law, but however it is to be explained, that so far is it from being true that the law makes us holy, that on the contrary, it is the instrument by which we become exceeding sinful, However that is to be explained, it is beyond all doubt that the law cannot sanctify, cannot make us holy, righteous, and good. It doesn't have such power. Ultimately, God, whose law it is, does not purpose such a function and use of the law. Nowhere, therefore, do the Reformed creeds ascribe sanctifying power to the law, even though they all recognize that the law does have a role in the holy life of the child of God. A striking significant truth about question 115 of the Heidelberg Catechism is that at the conclusion of its thorough explanation of the Ten Commandments, the Catechism asks this question, quote, Why will God then have the Ten Commandments so strictly, or as the German original is, so sharply preached? And now I emphasize, since no man in this life can keep them, end of quote. If no one can keep the law, the law certainly cannot very well function as the power of sanctification. To look to the law for holiness would be as though an infant child who hasn't taken his first step yet and is about to learn to walk would look to a marathon runner for the instruction and ability to walk. And when the Heidelberg Catechism answers the question, why God will have the Ten Commandments so strictly preached, the answer is not that the law sanctifies us. Not at all. But the answer is rather that being continually reminded of our inability to keep the commandments because of our, quote, sinful nature, end quote, we always pray, quote, for the grace of the Holy Spirit, end quote, to enable us to obey the law and to increase in holiness. If the law does not sanctify us, the question is urgent, what does sanctify us? Where do we look for holiness, including the victory over some besetting sin in our life? That's a very practical question. Where do I look for holiness in my life? Where do I look for the power 
to love God. Where do I look for the ability to separate myself from the wicked world, not only out there, but especially in here? Where do we look? And the answer is to the crucified and risen Jesus Christ as he is made known and exerts his sanctifying power by the gospel. Jesus Christ is our sanctification as truly and fully as he is our righteousness. This is the express testimony of 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. I quote, But of him, that's God, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Verse 31 adds that the purpose of Christ being our sanctification is that, quote, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, end quote. If my sanctification, my holy life, were not Jesus Christ, but a matter of my own obedience to the law, that is, if the law sanctified me, I could, and I assure you I would, glory in myself. Jesus Christ is not only our righteousness, he is also our sanctification, our holiness. He, he himself, in his resurrected body, he, in his glorified soul and body in heaven, at God's right hand, is our sanctification. That is, Jesus Christ is our consecration to God in love. Jesus Christ is our cleansing from, separation from, and hatred of sin. Jesus is our sanctification as he becomes ours actually. I may say experientially by our union with him which is our faith in him just as we are justified by faith and by faith alone and not by our obedience to the law so are we sanctified by faith and by faith alone and not by the law the good news Tonight is that sanctification, that aspect of our salvation, that indis indispensable aspect of our salvation, is not by our own works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. This is explicitly the testimony of the Bible. We're all familiar with the Bible passages that teach justification by faith alone. We're not so familiar with the Bible passages that teach sanctification by faith and by faith alone. <clears throat> Soon after Christ's ascension into heaven, a great synod of the church was held in Jerusalem. That was the synod of the early apostolic church. And there the issue was not only the truth of justification, but also the truth of sanctification, the truth as to how one becomes and how one remains holy. At that great Jerusalem Synod, as recorded in Acts chapter 15, the Apostle Peter preached, quote, God purifies the hearts of his people by faith, end quote. Not by the law, but by faith. Faith in Jesus, who is our sanctification, and who actually sanctifies us by faith in himself. According to Acts 26, verse 18, when the Lord Jesus called Paul to his apostleship, the Lord promised Paul that he, the Lord Jesus, would turn the Gentiles, quote, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, end quote. 
Through the bond of faith, which is union with Jesus Christ, the holy Jesus, who in heaven is our sanctification, becomes ours. He becomes ours in such a way that he sanctifies us, working in us his own holiness. This is our cleansing from sin. This is our consecration to God in love. Jesus Christ in us. Because our spiritual union with Christ is the work of the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of Christ, and because the presence of the Holy Christ in us is by the indwelling Spirit, our sanctification is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Not the law is the worker of holiness in us, but the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. How the Apostle stresses this in Romans 8, which is really the conclusion of his doctrine of sanctification, begun already in chapter 6 and continued in chapter 7. I quote, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. End quote. Verse 2. Then again, ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Verse 9. And then finally, verse 13, quote, If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. End quote. What the Holy Spirit does in the children of God to accomplish our holiness is to sprinkle the blood of Jesus upon our soul. <clears throat> Sanctification, I remind us, is the divine work of cleansing us from the filth, the pollution, and the reigning power of sin. There is only one cleansing agent with regard to the impurity and foulness of sin. That cleansing agent is the blood of Jesus Christ. John Owen wrote, quote, To fancy that there is any cleansing from sin, but by the blood of Christ, is to overthrow the gospel. This sprinkling of the blood of Jesus within and upon our soul takes place by means of the gospel. I refer especially to the preaching of the gospel, and in connection with the preaching of the gospel, our reading and study of the gospel of Scripture. Christ sanctifies. Christ sanctifies by sprinkling our hearts and souls with his blood. Christ sanctifies by sprinkling us with the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit operates in this cleansing work, not apart from the Word of God, but by means of the Word of God. In John 15, verse 3, Jesus tells us, quote, Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, end quote. In John 17, verse 17, the chapter we read on the Lord's Day, Jesus prayed, quote, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. End quote. Sanctification, therefore, takes place, continues, and increases progressively in church. As one attends a true church diligently on the Lord's Day, and there hears believingly, the gospel of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then, as by the power of that preached word, one also throughout the week reads and meditates upon the gospel of the scripture. Summing up, Jesus is our sanctification, and he sanctifies by our faith in him through which we have the sprinkling 
of his blood by the presence and working of his Holy Spirit in the fellowship of his church. And this vital aspect of salvation is promised to all elect believers. We receive and enjoy the salvation of sanctification not as something we deserve, not as something we have obtained or must obtain by our own striving, not by the law, but we receive this sanctification as the gracious promise of God. God promised this already in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, verse 33, quote, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. End quote. And then there is the wonderful promise of sanctification in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27. Quote, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. This is encouragement to us all in the struggle that we all have in common. The struggle against sin, especially against sin as we find it within our own selves. Can I be victorious? Is a question that the struggling child of God sometimes asks. Is there possibility for me a victory over this or that particular besetting sin which is so powerful in me? This is the encouragement God has promised it to you. And God will keep his promise. You will have the victory. You will overcome. You and I will live lives of holiness. Our sanctification is not by the law in the sense that it depends on something we have done. In the sense that sanctification is conditional. Rather, sanctification is the realization in the elect for whom Christ has died of the purely gracious promise of the sanctifying God. To this denial that the law sanctifies, the question arises, does then the law have no place in our sanctification? Indeed, in view of the laws becoming the occasion of more aggressive sinning, is the law evil? And should we dispense with the law altogether? As is in fact the teaching of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of professing Christians all over the world today who adhere to the tenets of dispensationalism. The law, they say, was only for Old Testament Israel and will be for Israel again in the future, in the millennium. But the law is not for the New Testament church, not at all. They charge that to bring in the law in any way whatsoever is to fall from the gospel of grace. So far did the originators of this dispensational heresy go with this that some of them taught that all of the commands in the New Testament, they couldn't escape the fact that the New Testament contains commands, were, and now I quote one of those founders of dispensationalism, C.I. Schofield, Suggestions. God has suggestions for you. He suggests that you worship him alone. Good suggestion. 
He suggests that a man live faithfully with his wife and that a wife live faithfully with her husband. He suggests that your children obey your parents and honor your parents in the Lord. Is that the implication of the Reformed doctrine that the law does not sanctify us? The law has a role, an important role, a necessary role in our life of holiness and therefore in God's work of sanctifying us. First of all, we must with the Apostle in Romans 7 affirm that the law is not sin, verse 7, but holy, just, and good, verse 12. Nor is it the case that the law, which is good in itself, is, quote, death unto me, end quote, verse 13. On the contrary, the law is good. On the contrary, the law is only good. On the contrary, there is nothing bad about the law, whatever. How could it be otherwise, since the law is the perfect will of God, expressing the goodness, the righteousness, and the holiness of God himself. The explanation why the law cannot sanctify and why, in fact, the law becomes the occasion for our greater sinfulness is not the evil of the law, but the evil of the depravity of us sinners. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Romans 7, verse 14. When that good law of God comes into contact with me, especially by being sharply preached in church, that law exposes me to myself as by nature totally depraved and corrupt. The result is that I become a much worse sinner in my own consciousness before the law ever came to me. Especially does the Tenth Commandment expose me inasmuch as the Tenth Commandment forbids and condemns not only wicked deeds, but also wicked desires and passions. That's what Paul teaches in Romans 7, verse 9. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. It exposes us to ourselves as the sinful creatures we are by nature. And in that respect, the law becomes the occasion for greater sinfulness. But in addition, the law does more. The law arouses my sinful nature so that my innate wickedness expresses itself more strongly when the law applies to me than it would have expressed itself otherwise. I think here of a homely example. There is a sleeping bear in his cave. As long as you leave that sleeping bear alone, he's not much of a threat to you. But when you prod that sleeping bear with a sharp stick, you arouse that bear to a fury against yourself. Such is the functioning of the law. God's sharp stick. And the effect of that sharp stick is to increase us in our sinfulness. The Apostle expresses this in Romans 7 verse 13. Sin by the commandment becomes exceedingly sinful. End of quote. We all know this from experience in our own life. Tell a little child, do not touch that vase. And there's nothing more that that little child wants to do from then on than to touch that vase. Before you told him not to, the thought never entered his mind. Once he has been forbidden to touch the vase, touching the vase becomes important to him. 
It is not so that the denial that the law sanctifies is a denial that the law has any role at all in the Christian's holy life, or a denial that the role of the law in the Christian life is important, even necessary. The law has a role or function in our holy Christian life. The role is of vital importance, so vital that a holy life is impossible without our right use of the law. And this role of the law is not only, or even mainly, that the law exposes to us our sinfulness. This is a function of the law in the church and in the life of the child of God. The Reformed faith recognizes with the Bible two main uses of the law in the life of the Christian and in the church. One role is to give us the knowledge of the misery of our sin, as the Heidelberg Catechism teaches in question three. Whence knowest thou thy misery? Out of the law of God. To this function of the law, Paul refers in Romans 7, verse 7, quote, I had not known sin, but by the law, end of quote. He continues significantly, quote, I had not known lust, sinful desire, except the law had said, here comes the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet, end of quote. That's one purpose of the law. That's how the law must function in your life and in mine. As long as we live, it exposes to us our sinfulness, our true misery. But the law also serves another purpose of God regarding salvation. And in the Reformed estimation, this other role is the more important work of the law in the life of the church and in the life of the Christian. The law is the rule or guide or standard of a holy life of gratitude for salvation to the glory of God. To the law, as this clear, infallible rule, the apostle refers in Romans 7, verse 25, quote, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, end of quote. This is the role of the law that is recognized by the Heidelberg Catechism in its third part, which instructs concerning the Christian's holy life of thankfulness. The good works that Christ produces in us are done consciously, quote, according to the law of God, end quote, question 91 of the Catechism. That means that the law is the guide and standard of our Christian life. In that section of the Heidelberg Catechism, all of the Ten Commandments are carefully and thoroughly explained, obviously with the intent and the expectation that Christians will obey these commandments. Question 114 of the Catechism states that those converted to God begin to live, quote, according to all the commandments of God, end of quote. Such is our need, even as regenerated children of God, that we must have clear, full, explicit direction what kind of life and what kind of behavior is pleasing to God and explicit direction how we are to express our love for the God who has saved us. God must instruct us that we love him. God must also instruct us how we are to love him. The reasons why this is necessary are at hand. Even after we are born again, we remain totally depraved by nature. We retain that depraved nature which is inclined to all evil. Then also, 
even though we now have a new and holy nature, that's the beginning of eternal life, we are weak and imperfect. Also, we live in a world that deceives us and attracts us. And then most dangerous of all to our holy life, there is a devil, Satan. And Satan and his hosts tempt us to lead us astray. Where would we be without an authoritative guide and rule? When we are hiking, perhaps in a mountain area with some dangers, we welcome a clear path that will lead us to the peak, and even some directions by the rangers on their boards. This is the way, not that way. Without an authoritative guide and rule concerning the Christian life, that leads to heaven, we would certainly construct a Christian life after our own liking or be deceived into falsifying what a holy life actually is. The law of God must be inscribed upon our hearts as it is when we are born again. It must also be written on the pages of a book, a reliable book, an inspired book, the holy scriptures. This is the way. Walk on it. That is not the way that leads to destruction. Avoid it. If there is anyone here this evening who doubts the necessity of a guide which the law is, let him or her reflect what the churches are teaching as the holy life of Christians today. Not now what the wicked world is teaching, but what the churches are teaching about a Christian life. Revolution against the civil magistrates, if one is displeased by the decisions of the magistrates. Stealing from the rich. Stealing, they say, in order to give to the poor, but stealing Nevertheless, there is the creation by the churches of a new and different God than the God of Scripture by the false doctrines concerning God that abound. There is the teaching as a permissible Christian holy life of divorce for practically any reason. And then the rightness of the adultery of a remarried person in the churches. There is today in the West the teaching of the holiness and permissibility of the sexual perversion of homosexuality. And then in the West, in the churches, there is the approval of the murder of unborn and partially born infants in the abomination of abortion. Don't you think we need a guide, a standard, an authoritative, infallible standard as to what the Christian life, a holy life, consists of? Rightly, in John Kelvin, in the Heidelberg Catechism, this use or role of the law as the guide of the Christian life is the most important. More space is devoted in Kelvin's Institutes and in the Heidelberg Catechism to the use of the law as the rule of the Christian life than is devoted to any other use of the law. God must be loved, thanked, and praised by us. This is our own ardent desire. We thank and praise him by a holy life, 
as was his great purpose in electing us and in redeeming us. And the holy life is the life that accords with his law and no other life. I have been referring to the three forms of unity tonight. Let me demonstrate that the Westminster standards are in full agreement with the three forms of unity on this matter. The Westminster Confession of Faith explains the rightful function of the law in our Christian life. I quote, chapter 19, article 6, of great use to true believers in that as a rule of life, informing them of the will of God and their duty, it directs and binds them to walk accordingly. End of quote. That the law of the Ten Commandments is our rule for a holy life does not exclude, but rather includes, other guides or rules of a Christian life or walk. An important rule or standard of the Christian life is the gospel itself. The gospel is the power of the Christian life, and it also functions as a rule or standard of the Christian life. That's taught in Philippians 1, verse 27, quote, Only let your conversation, that's your Christian life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, end quote. There the word becometh means worthy of. It points out that the gospel functions as the standard with which our behavior must harmonize. Then we should add to the law also the example of Jesus as the rule of our Christian life. This is not as though the life of Jesus adds something that is not found in the law, and certainly not as though the life of Jesus contradicts the law, but the life of Jesus illustrates the demands of the law clearly. 1 Peter 2 verse 21 exhorts us to Observe and follow the example of Jesus, particularly in suffering patiently abuse and persecution at the hands of the ungodly. I quote, Even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, example that ye should follow his steps. End of quote. The apostle then reminds us that when Jesus was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that justifieth or judgeth righteously. 1 Peter 2, verse 23. The life of Jesus Christ in the Bible is not only an example, but it is an example. It is not an addition to the law as the guide of our life, but the example of Jesus illustrates perfect obedience to the law. I close tonight by asking and answering with you how the church and how the believer maintain this role of the law, namely as the guide of the Christian life. The church must teach the law, and the church must teach the law as the rule of life, it belongs to the mark of a true church that a church teaches the law and teaches the law to New Testament Christians as the authoritative will of God that is to be the standard or rule of their life. The Bible does this. Every New Testament book I emphasize this especially against the dispensational error that maintains that the law was only for Israel in the Old Testament and will again be for Israel in the time of the fictitious millennium. Every New Testament book commands and exhorts the precepts of the law upon the believers as the rule of a holy life of gratitude. Many before me have observed that the New Testament mentions every one of the Ten Commandments as binding upon the church 
in the New Testament, except, some say, for the fourth commandment concerning Sabbath observance. And I dissent from that supposed exception. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, and Revelation 1, verse 10, the latter expressing John's statement that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, thus setting the first day of the week apart as a special day. I dissent from that supposed exception because those two passages, among others, imply the calling to keep the New Testament Sabbath, the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection of Jesus. The Bible exhorts the law not only as a means to know our sinfulness, but also as the guide of an obedient, holy life. Reformed churches carry out this calling, some do anyway, by preaching the Heidelberg Catechism at one of the services on the Lord's Day that requires of the minister of those churches also to preach the third part of the Catechism, which happens to be the longest section of the three in the Catechism, which consists in large part of careful, thorough explanation of the Ten Commandments of the Law of God. Every few years, therefore, the members of those churches are instructed both concerning the law as the rule of their life and concerning what this rule consists of in detail. Whether it preaches the Heidelberg Catechism or not, a church that fails to give such instruction concerning obedience to the law of God becomes responsible for the unholy lives of the members. Then with the instruction concerning the law as the rule of life, church must discipline members who show themselves impenitently unholy. And in the Protestant Reformed churches, the official church discipline of every sinner not only mentions to the congregation that a certain member is barred from the Lord's Supper and finally excommunicated from the church, but also mentions the commandment of the law which is the basis for this discipline. That brings home to the people of God, the children and the young people as well, the importance, the necessity of obedience to the law of God as the Christian life. That's how the law must function in the church. The law also has its function in the life of each elect believing child of God. Each elect believing child of God maintains this role of the law as the guide of the Christian life. By means of the sharp preaching of the law, in a soundly reformed church, the believer is disciplined by Jesus Christ through his spirit to measure his life by the standard of the law, and then to pray and to strive that he or she is in accordance with the law of God. To have this heartfelt desire and self-disciplining striving after holiness, the believer must be able to declare with the psalmist in Psalm 119, Oh, how love I thy law. And if he will love the law, so as ardently to desire and strive to keep it, he must be thankful for God's gracious deliverance of him, both from the guilt of his sin and from the reigning power of sin over him. And that's how Romans 7, which was read tonight, concludes. O oh, wretched man that I am! Not that I used to be before I was born again and saved, but am now, after I have been born again, now when I am indwelt by the Spirit of Christ, 
and am united to Christ by faith. For I still possess a depraved nature, so that the good that I want to do, I do not do. And the evil that I want not to do, I do. And I still have only a small beginning of the new obedience. But in answer to my anguished cry, this is the experience of us all who believe in Jesus Christ. In answer to my anguished cry, continuing with the end of Romans 7, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Comes the answer, delivered by God through Jesus Christ, in that God forgives my sin and empowers me anew to will and to begin to do the good. So that the end is that I thank God in this daily lifelong thankfulness for gracious salvation. I quote now Romans 7 once more. With the mind, I myself serve the law of God. Thank you.